start. Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome. Uh, thanks for being here on behalf of the National Alliance of Mental Illness of Racine County. We appreciate your participation on this forum on critical mental health issues facing our community. I'd first like to thank the Racine Public Library for making this space available for us this evening, especially during a major renovation project. I'm glad you all found the side door <laughs> as you get into the facility. Um, and I'd like to just briefly introduce our distinguished panel, and then I'm going to give each of them an opportunity to give a much more detailed introduction subsequent to that. And then I'll also just briefly cover our format this evening. We're attempting a hybrid event, so we have a very nice crowd in person, as well as people joining us via Zoom and Facebook Live. So we're going to try to coordinate all that technology. So first to the very brief introductions, I'll just go right to my right to left. We have Representative Whitman from the 62nd Assembly District, the incumbent. Representative Voss from the 63rd Assembly District, who's also the uh, Speaker of the Assembly of Wisconsin. We have Representative Neubauer from the 66th Assembly District, who's also the Minority Leader in the Assembly. And then we have Anthony Hamas, who is a candidate in the 62nd Assembly District. So welcome all. We're also pleased to have with us this we'll evening as our moderator, uh, Adam Rogan, who is the news editor of the Racine Journal Times. Uh, we also did invite Senator Weingart this evening. Uh, he sends his regrets. He had another obligation, but he did express interest in continuing the dialogue on these important issues. I should also mention that I've learned a little more about the actual Senate districts that cover Racine County today. I've been educated by some of our legislators. So the 64th Assembly District also incorporates part of Racine County. Unfortunately, the advocacy chair failed to invite the candidates from the 64th Assembly District. So and the 82nd. And the 82nd, yeah. right. So uh, we will be reaching out and doing a separate session with candidates for those districts. And I promise in the future, I will do a complete review of that map before we invite uh, candidates. Um, our format this evening, we're going to give each of our distinguished panelists up to three minutes to make some introductory remarks about themselves, about their district, about their motivation to run for office, especially as it relates to mental health issues. Subsequent to those introductions, we will then go to prepared questions. Our uh, advocacy committee has prepared several questions for the panelists. Adam Rogan will be posing those questions, and each uh, candidate will have up to two minutes to respond. Subsequent to that, we will solicit additional questions from the audience, both in person and virtual. We'll pass around some cards. So if you have a question in our in person audience, please uh, jot those down, hand it, hand it to me, and I will get it uh, to the panel. And obviously, if you're attending via Zoom or Facebook Live, please uh, indicate your questions in the chat. After audience questions, We'll then give each candidate one minute for some closing remarks. Any questions on the format? Uh, there are facilities for this door, and if those are needed during the event. So, without further ado, I'll turn it over uh, to Mr. Rogan to start the introductory remarks. And you can choose what order you want to go. So, <laughs> I think let's do the same order as Bob. Why don't you okay. introduce yourself to our viewers and those in the room? Um, real quick, just your background, and then we can get on to questions. Okay. So uh, my name is Bob Whitkey. I represent the 62nd Assembly District, which has the uh, portions of Racine, villages of Wind Point, Caledonia, Raymond, uh, town of Norway, and now town of Waterford. Uh, lifelong Racine County resident, graduated from Orlick High School, graduated from UW-Eau Claire. My uh, background is in finance and accounting. Uh, I currently sit on the I'm Vice Chair of Ways and Means Committee. I sit on K through 12 education, uh, colleges and universities. I chaired the uh, Jobs and the Economy Committee, uh, co-chaired the uh, Speaker's Task Force on Racial Disparities. Uh, I'm part of the Building Commission and uh, was able to get uh, 14 pieces of legislation I either authored or co-authored uh, signed into law this session. So. Yeah. All right. Uh, my name is Robin Voss. I represent the 63rd Assembly District, which if you think about Highway 11, it is basically from the mall out to the Walworth County line. 
uh, that's the Sixth Degree District. Um, I've been in the legislature since 2005. I'm married. Um, I have two stepchildren, and I own a business with about 100 employees. Um, so that's uh, in addition to being the speaker. So as the speaker, I have the opportunity to work with all 99 members of the assembly, um, focusing on issues that are the most important to the state of Wisconsin and trying to find consensus to be able to get things over to the governor. Um, over the course of the past decade, I think we have really done a good job in Wisconsin. We can always do better, but I think we've made some seriously good progress on dealing with issues affecting those who have mental health uh, concerns. So like most of you here and probably almost everybody watching, um, I have people that I love who have mental health issues. Um, they have serious issues. Um, they have dealt with schizophrenia. They have dealt with um, all kinds of other things that I know many of you are familiar with, but unfortunately far too many people in the world don't understand that having a mental health issue is no different than having a broken leg or cancer. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that we have tried really hard over the course of the past decade to deal with the stigma that unfortunately still exists for far too many people who struggle with mental health issues. So I'm glad to be here. Look forward to answering your questions and hopefully we can keep addressing those as we go forward. Great, uh, my name is Greta Neubauer. I represent the 66th district, which we are in right now, welcome. Um, I was born and raised in Racine and have been representing this community throughout four and a half years, and I became the minority leader, the Democratic leader in January. Um, really happy to be at this event with you all. It actually is one of the few opportunities we have uh, each cycle to get up here and really talk about our ideas, and so we're really grateful to NAMI um, for doing this every election cycle for, for state representatives. Um, and such a huge thank you to NAMI, of course, for the work that you do all the time. Uh, I know that you are a critical resource in this community. I know many of you who are here are involved and listening online, you know, helping provide those supports that people in Racine really need. So we're so grateful for that. Um, you know, uh, let's see, what else do I have to say about myself? You know, I, I ran for office because I really wanted Racine to be a place where uh, young people wanted to live and wanted to stay. And we are continuing to do that work in Wisconsin to make uh, Wisconsin a place that, that young people choose because they know it's a great place to live. And a critical part of that, I think, is providing the resources people need when it comes to struggling with mental health. Since the pandemic, um, I have heard again and again, particularly from parents, about the fears they have for their young people um, coming out of this really difficult time and trying to um, perform in school and move forward with their lives after what was just, just a very difficult period for all of us, but especially young people. So really glad that we get to have this conversation tonight, talk about our ideas, um, and uh, share with you all our plans for the future. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Anthony Hammett. I am the State Assembly candidate for District 62. Uh, like Bob, we rep he represents, and I hope to represent, Caledonia, parts of Racine, Franksville, the town of Raymond, Norway, Wind Lake and Waterford. I am very excited to be here tonight as I am very passionate about mental health. Before I decided to enter politics, I have been working to help fix our mental health system. I've spent the past year working with DHS and the DQA, getting claims about substandard care substantiated and assisted in developing new protocols at Winnebago Mental Health. Our efforts resulted in new regulations for the cleanliness and quality of care at that facility, where many patients from Racine County end up going for care. We've worked to improve patient safety with issues such as ensuring they have clean drinking water. Through these efforts, I have learned firsthand what the, these facilities lack due to consecutive budget cuts. I've met and gotten to know many people who are living with mental illness who have lost along the way to the struggle. I've asked, I was asked by someone at NAMI if I'd be willing to go before state legislators and represent these stories, present these stories. I said, I'll do you one better, I'll become a legislator. Mm -hmm. Although improving mental health is what originally put me on the pathway to becoming a state legislator, I have discovered so many important topics where Wisconsin citizens need the right person and voice that will speak for them. And this is what brings me to this debate tonight. I am a proud member of NAMI. I hope to see all of you walking to improve mental health this Saturday at the NAMI Walks Your Way and More. Thank you. I want to open up with a question that's kind of the broad strokes. Um, the, the, the national launch of the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline was launched in July, I believe. 
Ohio is doing everything we have to comprehend the mental health crisis response, to a comprehensive mental health crisis response system. So I guess we're seeing this kind of one of the most robust in the United yeah. States. Um, what are your views on the role of the state legislature in ensuring that there is a comprehensive mental health crisis plan that is acceptable in the King County and throughout the state? I don't want to just um, flip it with the hearing up and we'll move back to it. All right, thank you. Uh, listen, we have a real mental health crisis in Wisconsin and especially in King County. It is imperative we get legislators that are willing to step up and start producing some bills to support three key pillars identified by NOPS. We need legislators that can produce bills that will actually receive a hearing and get passed. Republicans have repeatedly stated that the solution to mass shootings is improved mental health care, so it's time for them to put their money where their mouth is. Their call to improve mental health as a response to mass shooting provides us with a unique opportunity to co-author a bill that would easily be supported by both parties, thus ensuring it would get passed. And a quick fact, most individuals living with a mental illness are no more likely to be violent than anyone else. So it's, try, it's time for us to start embracing and caring for them the way they deserve. So I served over the last uh, cycle, the, the session on the Finance Committee, Budget Committee, no longer, but um, during this budget cycle and for short term afterward. And we as legislators have significant opportunities to improve our, our care in this community. We all know someone who's trying to access care in this community, and we all know that we need more resources um, in, in Racine County. So one specific thing you know, I really want to point to in this regard is that there's been a $10 million request for crisis intervention services that the Department of Health Services and Wisconsin County Association has pending before the Joint Finance Committee, and these funds would expand and enhance the state's crisis intervention services directly um, and aid in that assessment, in that intervention and stabilization for individuals who are experiencing crisis. So this is something that we can do anytime, um, and I really hope that the legislature moves. Uh, the chairs of the Joint Finance Committee move to take that up, and you all can reach out to them anytime and encourage them to do so. So I hope that as we go through answering the questions, we try to spend as much time answering your questions and listening to the concerns as opposed to just getting into partisan arguments where it's Republicans versus Democrats, Democrats versus Republicans. I think if you watch TV, we probably can all agree we probably have too much of that. So when I think about the issues that are important to me, um, if you remember, we had speakers task forces over the course of the past decade. Uh, those have all come out of my office. One of the ones, obviously, we had a speakers task force on mental health. Uh, Sandy Pash, a Democrat, and Eric Severson, a medical doctor. She was a nurse, he was a doctor. Uh, they were the chair and co-chair of the, I'm sorry, chair and vice chair of this committee that really focused on mental health issues. Mm -hmm. And we found a couple things that are still true today as much as they were back then. Uh, number one, we do not have enough providers. Uh, that is one of the biggest challenges that we have. And frankly, it's every career, right? From uh, picking up the garbage to being a dental hygienist. We need people in every single field. Uh, but especially people who deal with those who have mental health challenges. We don't have enough psychologists. We don't have enough folks who deal with them on a short-term and a long-term basis. So one of the things that we did, and it actually came out of the Speakers Task Force that had formed on foster care, uh, we created the 211 system, uh, which actually was prior to 988, uh, but it was the same idea where we allowed folks to call into 211 accessing long-term or short-term mental health issue, uh, mental health uh, funding sources, but also really just having somebody to talk to because we knew with the shortage of providers, it wasn't that easy to just say, find an appointment and get to be able to talk to a provider. Uh, so I think those are some examples of things that we have done, funded by the state uh, in a way that made a difference. And I think it's all because we had good people stepping up saying that there are better solutions than just kind of throwing money around. Mr. Lincoln? Yep, thank you. Uh, so uh, I think we just have to continue the work that we've started over the past three years uh, the budget has invested in different mental health programs and grants. Uh, in the last budget, we provided over 250,000 for peer-to-peer -peer suicide prevention grants. Uh, as being a former president uh, of the school board here in this district, I fully understand um, some of the things that uh, our students face uh, in this in this area. Uh, I also work very closely with Hope Auto and uh, people that she's got in uh, Racine County to try to understand the needs that are the investments that would uh, be best for our county as well as over the state. One, one of the issues that hasn't been raised is that we don't have enough beds in this state right now uh, to be able to house uh, some of the people that need um, 
uh, Bethel College Services. Uh, as part of the building commission, uh, in, in, in our capital budget, uh, we have, uh, which I'm part of the build, building commission, we have allocated monies towards uh, refurbishing places at uh, uh, Winnebago, uh, Medona, and then uh, we've uh, honored most of the, I believe all the requests for the Department of Corrections uh, to be able to upgrade uh, many of the uh, health services uh, facilities within, within our prison system. And so uh, to increase, uh, to continue to increase the, the money that's uh, dedicated to many of these grant programs and so on, one of the things that I believe is important is that we have to understand uh, the dollars that we spend because uh, with, when you put together a state budget, uh, there are only so many funds to, to be able to work with, that every dollar that we invest uh, is, is going to be to, towards something that actually works. I'm glad you both mentioned that today, Kevin. Feeds into the next question. There is a shortage of mental health professionals. There is a, uh, that seems to be perhaps even more significant shortage of mental health beds. Um, what what has not been done that perhaps could be accomplished in the 2023 session um, to uh, to at least bring more mental health professionals into the state and or create more mental health beds to treat those needs on the north side and the opposite side of the state. So. Um, oh, uh, one of, um, since these microphones are imperfect, we can, um, we've all done a good job of making sure to project, speak to the back of the room as best you can, just so that everyone can hear us perfectly. Well. Okay, so uh, there are shortages, um, I think, in just about every industry that we have. Uh, one of the things that um, has kind of related to this shortage uh, has our, been our, our ability to license professionals and get them quickly into uh, place. Uh, the current uh, administration, there is a huge problem uh, in the licensing process, and the licenses are taking way too long for people. And one of the top groups that um, is not uh, getting licensed quick enough is the uh, social workers um, that we have in our, uh, and I've heard from several of them, and they are sometimes waiting months uh, for, for an agency to give them a license. Uh, we need to continue to find ways to invest in, in beds. And I know we I have colleagues that are in northwestern Wisconsin that are looking at other uh, solutions as far as adding additional beds in, in key, key parts of the state. Uh, beyond that, I think we just uh, need to continue to um, look at programs um, that are, there's a, a, a program now that's there that uh, does fund some uh, grant money towards uh, different uh, college programs uh, for psychiatry and so on. Uh, we, I don't think the program has been um, upped in funding um, in many years, so we may need to take a look at some of those programs and, and grants that we have. Uh, Bob's right on that last one. That actually came again out of our speaker's task force where we have a loan forgiveness program for people who go to become a psychologist um, and we've only had a relatively small number of people graduate from UW institutions with a degree. So while it's been successful, we certainly could do more in that area. But part of it is just getting more people to want to go into the field as much as it is anything else. Um, in the last session, we passed something called Act 22, uh, which really took a serious look at the red tape and the difficulties it is for people getting into the profession. So hopefully that was one way that we could step up and make it somewhat easier, not simple, but somewhat easier for anybody who wants to get into the profession. Uh, we also passed Act 131, which says that if you have a license to practice in another state, uh, basically it's a, a compact where you can come and practice in Wisconsin, making it less onerous to say, I wanna to move to Wisconsin and practice and have to go through a whole bunch of rigmarole to be able to do what you could do in the state you just resided in. So those were two bills just this last session that I think, again, focus on red tape, getting rid of barriers that really don't do anybody any good. Uh, over the course of the past couple sessions, we also increased funding for an awful lot of the mental health services that we provide uh, through the state. So I know that in the last session, we had a very large increase in funding for people who are in long-term care services, mostly in an assisted living and nursing home. Um, but it really helps to keep people inside those facilities better paid so that they have the staff to adequately address that. So I think that's another area where, of course, we think primarily of people who are hopefully living at home or living with a loved one. There's an awful lot of people who also have mental health challenges who live in some kind of long-term care or assisted living facility, and we try to make sure that they're also prioritized. 
Yeah, so when I think about the access challenges we have in our part of the state, um, there are a number of different facets to think about this through. And there are a couple of groups that have particular challenges that I think we need to hone in on and address. One of those being veterans in our community, um, who we know uh, have, uh, have just significant challenges, uh, additional, uh, sort of more so than the general population, often in terms of mental health care. And so one thing I did want to um, point out is that actually today, Governor Ebert has announced some additional money um, to go towards case management and support um, for veterans. Very excited to see that $1.5 million that will go to providing a number of services, including mental health care. And I think that's the kind of program that we need to be thinking about as we're going into the next session, putting more money into programs like that. Um, you know, I, I keep coming back to kids, but I do think that it's just so important that we remain focused on young people, particularly because they're not in the room, right? And they're not in the legislature to be able to advocate for themselves. And so a bill that we proposed this session, Assembly Bill 742, um, would have expanded department, the Department of Public Instruction's capacity for social and emotional learning um, training. And we also would have helped our public school districts just appropriately, more appropriately tackle mental health crises and um, future mental health crises of young people. So hopefully that's something that we can move forward next session. Um, you know, I think we can find a lot of common ground in terms of the need to provide um, resources to the groups who are most directly impacted uh, in our community. Uh, we need to incentivize students to choose careers in mental health care. We can offer student loan forgiveness for in-state institutions, such as for each year you work in an underserved area or underserved field, you get a year taken off your loan. Mental health care providers need to be properly reimbursed to incentivize them to choose this tough but crucial discipline. We need to explore the most cost-effective ways to get different levels of mental health support for the individuals who need it. Look, we're in tough times. We need to remain fiscally responsible. We need to have a robust discussion about the reallocation of funds to prioritize mental health care. If we do this correctly, a great deal of money will be saved in the long run by taking a proactive rather than a reactive approach. As far as expanding the workforce, we don't have enough mental health care providers in the right places, and this is only likely to get worse in the future. We need quality, updated local facilities that serve the patients well and entice mental health professionals to choose them as their employer. Healthcare institutions need to be well reimbursed for mental health care so they will build better facilities. Additionally, I want to ensure local leaders are reaching out to high school students in all parts of the state to introduce careers in mental health services at an earlier age. And we need to ensure that providers of tomorrow are diverse and reflect the culture and ethnicity of the communities they serve. I think actually, uh, a follow up question. Sure. Any of us want to specifically put it down with it? And we'll jump in. You said you, you support reallocating funds to from uh, the state level specifically for the mental health. Yeah. What would you think? Would, what would that reallocation look like? What do you think we should do? Well, first off, I want to start. You know, we have a filled five billion dollar surplus, and now we've got another one point five billion. But the other things we have, we came with COVID crisis. Mental health is a crisis. We had COVID money immediately. That came from somewhere. And there's still COVID money circling the drain. Mm -hmm. Especially in Racine County, we still have funds. So the money is there. We just need to find it. Um, and this is something we've got to um, touch on, so I'll let you answer this question first. Um, half of all individuals living with a mental health condition experience their first symptoms by age 14 and 75% by the age of 24. And suicide remains a leading cause of death among those age groups. What specific measures do you support or would you like to propose to expand mental health services specifically for children and young adults? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm gonna keep throwing bill numbers at you all. <laughs> um, things that have been proposed in the last couple of sessions, but um, one that I will, 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 will put forward um, is Senate Bill 731. Some of you may be familiar, but this would expand the ability for school districts to be reimbursed for hiring counselors, social workers, psychologists, and nurses. And I think we all know when you talk to young people how long it takes for them to talk to someone at school if there's someone even available for them to talk to about these really deeply personal issues, trauma, things going on at home that they need to talk through. Um, so really we need to make sure that we've got those professionals in school 
And we know that that's going to help kids right now. And we also know that it is truly critical for them as they get older um, to have addressed these issues as they're coming up um, and not wait many years into the future um, to actually be talking about what's going on for them um, and the challenges that they're experiencing. It will mean that they are better able to um, be part of our community, be civically engaged, hold on to work, um, all of those things that we hope for for everyone in our community. Ron? Well, the first thing we need to do is to make sure that we look back and recognize the mistakes that have been made over the course of the past year. Um, if you look at what happened as soon as COVID was declared, where we basically sent kids home, um, had them try to learn remotely, that was a huge error. And I think it's important for us to first admit that that was a mistake and should never happen again. Uh, because if you look at the impact that it had primarily on young people, especially kids, they went from a secure environment um, at school to many times a chaotic one at home. Um, perhaps two loving parents, I'll just take that for granted, um, one or two loving parents, but they had to work. They had to deal with their own situations. And I think that the bad decisions that were made surrounding COVID really made an unbelievably uh, difficult situation worse, uh, especially for young people. So the first thing we have to know is that social interaction and the ability to be together for young people is incredibly important. And that's why school is the place that many times we can do a better job delivering mental health services. Um, we increased funding in the last budget to improve mental health services in schools. I think that's a good thing. Um, I think we need to make sure though that at the same time, it is not a responsibility of the taxpayers to provide an additional service for every single child. That's what people have private insurance for. That's what people pay for their health insurance. And again, I don't want to create, I don't want to treat mental health as if it's somehow different than somebody who has a traditionally thought of healthcare issue. It's something that should be treated holistically and hopefully we have the ability to work together where schools can help to provide those resources, but they should not ever be the primary care provider. That is the job of the traditional system that we have. So I don't want to duplicate that and take the resources that we need to educate our kids, make sure that they have all the ability to become a successful citizen and try to transition that into now saying we're going to have a school be a place that's a daycare provider, the food provider, an education provider, mental health. It's just not possible. So I think we have to be really careful to think that somehow schools are going to be the magic answer without other ways of filling in those gaps. Robin, can you yeah. talk on that? Is the, again, if, if school, a school cannot be, and I'm just using quick, school cannot be the place for all of these different things. For a six-year-old kid who might be having some issue, or 14-year-old or 17-year-old who isn't on, whose parents don't have insurance or don't have an intended parent, how, where might they be able to fill services then if we, again, if we can't get it all in one building? Yeah, so the best, yeah, the best news for us is we live in Racine County, which by and large does a really good job uh, of having a comprehensive safety net for an awful lot of folks. We know that if you're in poverty, uh, which means that as a single person you're in less than $12,000 a year, you have access to Badger Care, which basically is free. No co-payments, no deductibles, no premium share, it's free. Um, if you have kids or you're married, that's obviously higher than that, that's just for individuals. So if you're above that, uh, we do have the exchange where people get subsidized care from a private care provider. Uh, and I think that's something that we should be pushing more people into so that they use the system that's already in place. I don't want to spend our dollars duplicating what's already happening and we don't have enough to begin with. Um, but I do think that at the end of the day, um, we have a good social safety net. It can always be better. We need more providers. We need to make sure we have better access. Uh, but I think by and large, we should, we're proud. We live in Racine County. I think Racine County does a good job. Uh, just a couple of things that I, that I would add, and I, and I think um, the speaker uh, makes a, a really valid point. Uh, if I go back to a committee hearing that we had um, back when they were, they were contemplating opening schools, it was, it was discussed but, and, and known at that time the type of mental health issues that we were going to have moving forward. Uh, especially if we kept things shuttered. There was a study done by the WIA that showed that uh, anxiety and other disorders amongst athletes um, increased over two periods by um, over 50%. And so um, we, we saw those things coming, and I think that, the, that we only have the tip of the iceberg now. Uh, one of the things that um, is going on currently is that I believe that we, there has to be more partnerships between um, local community, uh, the state, uh, as, and as well as private foundations and others. Uh, currently, uh, at six elementary schools here in, uh, in Racine, uh, there's, uh, there are mental health clinics 
um, that are being run by Children's Hospital. Um, and those are, these clinics are, are school-based. It helps with access. It helps to reduce the stigma uh, for the students and their families. Uh, the funding is in partnership with the United Way Community uh, Foundations and the school districts, which obviously get aid from the state. Uh, statewide, Children's got these up and running in about 70 schools. And the programming is, you know, relatively new, about six to seven years that we've got. So solutions like this need to be evaluated as far as how well they work and, and what the delivery is and, and where they should be um, accessed. Secondly, uh, Racine County will be leading the way with a juvenile um, uh, treatment center uh, that the state awarded $40 million uh, in 2017 for. We, uh, as part of the building commission, work closely with uh, the county to be able to uh, get them the additional funds so they will start breaking ground uh, next uh, next year, hopefully. Um, first off, the key is access. I'll support increased funding to enhance the number of mental health providers in the school system to work with children, teachers, and preschools, starting at the elementary, elementary school level, and, and uh, excuse me, to, to work with children, teachers, and principals starting in the elementary school and continually increase that number of providers through middle and high school. I would also like to see presentations like Tommy's Ending the Silence be available through the school for students in middle and high school and also for teachers and families. We need to ensure that there is a track for college students to pursue careers that will give back to mental health care in the community. And I would support loan forgiveness for those choosing mental health as a career. Um, and this will be my last question before we take your call. Oh, good. I'm sorry to interrupt you. We have a question. Carrie sent in a distributed fee. Is anyone interested in posing a question to the audience? Please jab it on the card. We'll get those to them. And for those of you attending virtually, if you can put them in the chat, we'll go through those and get those audience questions. Yes, yeah, sorry for the interruption. Um, so, uh, yeah, it is a position. It is the position of NAMI that there is a widespread um, there is a widespread issue of inappropriate incarceration of people living with mental health with mental illness. What is your view on the role of the state legislature in reducing unnecessary incarceration of people living with mental illness? And what um, proposals might you have or might you see coming forward that could lessen the likelihood of people with mental illness entering the criminal justice system? Um, a lot of clever ideas of who should go first. So who wants to take it? You guys go. Thank you. Um, so really appreciate this question and the work that NAMI has done on this issue. Um, we have significant racial disparities in Wisconsin in terms of our incarceration rates, and um, it, it's very clear that there's work to do in terms of providing greater services so that we can in, avoid um, incarceration that's a result of mental illness. Um, I served on the Mayor's Police Reform Task Force here in Racine a couple of years ago, and one of the ideas that we talked about a lot was um, social workers and those who are equipped to uh, handle and respond to people in mental health crisis going out um, with first responders. And uh, did a ride along a while ago in Racine County. And it was very clear to me uh, that there were a lot of people that our first responders were talking to who were in current or prolonged uh, periods of mental health instability. And so really pleased that Racine County actually has been a real leader in this area um, and is working on a program to have a uh, social worker go out and be there in these moments of mental health crisis for people in our community. Um, what the state can do is we can support more programs like that, which I have heard from first responders. They want right those resources there with them. They have been given training to handle those situations as best they can, but they will be the first to admit right that they're not social workers who spend all day thinking about mental health crises. So I'm um, really pleased to see that program happening here in Racine and just hope that we can expand that going forward. Dr. Hi, the last budget, I don't remember the exact number, but I think it was almost half a million dollars were provided for law enforcement training uh, to make sure that people who work in law enforcement are aware and are as well versed as they can be to deal with people who are having mental crisis issues and we don't assume that somebody is hostile just because they are having an episode. Um, so I think that's important. Um, I think it's also important in the last budget we provided, I think it was $10 million <coughs> for regional crisis health centers. 
I think that's also another way for us to be able to utilize those. You know, I, I think part of the problem in our society, frankly, is that we are letting too many people out of jail. Uh, there are people who should stay in jail because they committed crimes and they are certainly not ready to come out to society. I think that we have seen, especially all across the state, um, I was with a group the other day um, from Milwaukee uh, who literally had their car broken into in the 10 minutes they went inside on Major Street in downtown Milwaukee and had their luggage stolen, right? So I think we know that there are serious problems with our criminal justice system. Uh, the problem is, I agree with you that unfortunately people who are having a mental health crisis shouldn't be going to the jail as the first place where they are being dealt with. Uh, they should be able to go to a medical facility so that they get the appropriate treatment. But if you commit a crime, you commit a crime. You have to go to jail and pay the price for having that happen. So I, I think um, it shouldn't be an either or. I do agree that we do not want to use jails as our necessary um, and overflow place uh, for mental health people or people who are having mental health challenges. But I also don't want to simply say that uh, we want to reduce incarceration and have all of those people who commit a crime on the streets with us. And so I'll just reiterate, uh, I think Racine County has done a good job in trying to be ahead of this game. So if if we can get um, into our younger population earlier uh, before they turn to, turn to crime, um, this new uh, treatment center that will be built is state of the art. I think that that can help in, in some instances. Uh, the grants that the, the speaker was talking about um, in the last budget, uh, were up to a million dollars. Uh, I've written with uh, law enforcement agencies, uh, uh, all of the ones in my district, as well as with District 5 in Milwaukee. And uh, I think it's really evident once you ride with them um, to see uh, many of the issues that they deal with. Uh, and it does uh, frame a reference of things that we should be looking at in the budget to make investments in. Uh, and then once again, if you look nationally, uh, beds that have been available for people that have severe mental health issues um, to be able to be put in before they reach the criminal justice system has declined significantly. So I think we have to continue to look at uh, more inno innovative ways to put beds in areas where they're more accessible um, to people that need them earlier on. Uh, but uh, like I said, uh, the ride-alongs I had, we went to domestic ex uh, disputes, uh, well visits uh, with uh, grade school children, uh, as well as seeing people that are in uh, complete uh, distress uh, that needed help. And trying to separate what law enforcement's role is versus uh, the help that they need and to, to, to get them to a place where they need um, is, is something that I know that the law enforcement agencies across the, the state are, are, are working with currently. And to the extent we can su support that, um, we need to make sure that we make investments along those lines. Look, if a person violates the civil liberties of another citizen, I support following the laws without exception. However, if there are opportunities to divert nonviolent citizens who suffer from a mental illness into avenues other than incarceration, we must act upon them. We can start by ensuring all police officers become crisis intervention trained team officers, trained CIT trained officers, excuse me. I would propose a forum for police officers where they can listen to the experience of patients with mental illness to discuss their interactions with law enforcement during a mental health crisis. Social workers and or peer counselors should be an integral part of every crisis response team. Once a crisis situation has been de-escalated, a police officer or social worker should ensure the individual is set up with the Department of Health Services. We need to ensure that the DHS is adequately funded. We should monitor the results of the new 988 number and mobile crisis response lines to see if there are reductions in calls to our police departments for mental health crisis. And we need to ensure a comprehensive aftercare plan for any individual with mental illness who requires inpatient services. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Reading this question from Zoom, I cannot read who it's from. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, uh, the question is, uh, if elected, would you support a ban on assault we weapons? Why or why not? And then also, um, what did you? What are your thoughts on a policy for restricting uh, for gun control specifically for those who are documenting <laughs> mental health conditions? I can go first. Um, I I'm a supporter of the Second Amendment. I do not think um, that that would be a wise course of action for a couple reasons. Number one. Um, we see that um, the place with the strongest gun control in the entire country is 80 miles south of here, and that's the city of Chicago. Uh, they are in a raft of violence um, that is tragic, even though they have incredibly tough laws. So I think just putting more laws on the books um, isn't necessarily going to work. When we have some who are advocating for defunding of the police, and we need to have more officers on the street, we need to make sure that when somebody is charged with a crime, they go to jail. And when somebody is arrested, they're actually prosecuted. So I think that we have more than adequate laws on the books to ensure that we keep people safe. Uh, we just need to enforce them and utilize the tools that are already on the books. Um, I do not support red flag laws. I think that um, the very idea of saying that someone is going to have a constitutional right taken away from them before they've done anything wrong. Imagine if we said, you look like you might drink, so we're going to take away your car. Uh, that is what they would like to do with people who own a firearm. Uh, that to me is unconstitutional, and I just think it's not the right way to go. Now, once somebody's committed a crime or they've had an issue, uh, we already have laws on the books where somebody can um, work on making sure that a judge has the ability to look at that, uh, but doing it pre preemptively, that's just doesn't seem right to me. Anyone else like to weigh in? Sure, <laughs> go ahead. Um, so I think there are a number of uh, bills that have been discussed uh, in the legislature that would uh, hit some of the issues we've been talking about today. And one of those is universal background checks. If you are someone who should not have a gun, you should not be able to purchase a gun just because you know where to go to avoid the background check that would happen at a legitimate seller. And so that's something that I really think um, we should be able to find common ground on and move forward in Wisconsin. Um, I do support red flag laws. I think it is very important that if someone in a family or close to someone who is uh, watching them experience a crisis um, is able to go to law enforcement um, and tell them about that and do what they can to make sure that that person does not harm themselves or others. Um, it is not permanently taking away someone's right to own a firearm. It is a temporary conversation around making sure that that person uh, does not die by suicide or harm someone else. And so I think those are two things that we really should be able to agree on and move forward on in Wisconsin. Fine, do you have any, any I read everything she just said, but like our statement I said earlier, we need to take proactive approaches instead of reactive approaches over and over and over again. We are seeing the same instances happening and nothing is being done about that. It gets turned, gun sense. It's just gun sense. It's not taking away your second amendment. It's gun sensible responsibilities as a society to take care of one another and our children. I support red flag laws for the simple fact that someone should get a call or be approached when you order an array of bullets have a reason. There's no reason someone can't come to your facility or house and just say, what is your plan with these? If you have a plan, good, go for it. Go have your activity, whatever that may be. But there should be a question in there as to why someone is ordering a huge amount of bullets. Thank you. I might as well weigh in as well. <laughs> and so uh, I do not support red flag laws. Uh, I did support a law that one of my colleagues brought up, which was that a family member or family could take um, a gun from a, from a family member they felt was in distress or could harm themselves, take it to a gun shop and have it locked up until they felt that person was well. Uh, I don't believe in red flag laws because um, there's, there's too much uh, abuse. Uh, when it comes to gun control laws, I ask people one question, and I've asked this of many groups that have come to my office in the Capitol. Officer John Hetland was shot at Teaser's Bar on Lathrop Avenue, shot and killed, left a family behind. Um, 
the person that committed that crime had felony gun charges against him, was on parole. What law do you have that would have prevented that? If you have something that would prevent that, I will author the bill myself. Most people that have come to the Capitol that have advocated for gun laws don't have an answer for that. Those are the things that we need to prevent. We do have laws on the books. They need to be enforced. If they're enforced, we need to make sure that violent felons and people that get guns are put away so that they can't harm others in our society. There is something we could propose, and it is actually having people register their guns every year so that you have it, that you haven't passed it on illegally, that you haven't given it to a family member who's locking it up and then using it. Every year, you have to show that you still own that gun. You get your Second Amendment rights, you get your gun, but it is yours. No more ghost guns on the street coming from who knows where. So we have avenues we can approach, and we need to do it. So that would be another law. So as an example, it's already illegal for a felon to have a firearm, right? So if I give a firearm to my felon relative, both of us are already committing a crime. So having everybody register their firearm is going to do nothing more than create a list for people to be targeted by those who are anti-gun or those who believe that somehow you shouldn't have a right to own a firearm. So I would never support the idea of having everybody register their weapon. I think that would be a dangerous precedent, and I would never support it. Can that be? Transitioning here, I think I avoid this question the way it can be answered by everybody. How have the, the question here on the card from our member of the audience is, how have the municipal budget cuts impacted public health services and public safety in Wisconsin? I think you must be, if you, have you seen things about the budget cuts? Why don't you get your thing? I would assume this is a shared good question. How that impacted municipalities and what is the planning 2023 going forward to maybe change the status quo? Question for anybody. Go ahead, Ron. Well, I mean, the vast majority of mental health resources are paid for by the state. Cities, of course, local municipalities, we have the Racine County Public Health, but it's a little bit different. But we saw over the course of the pandemic, the largest amount of spending on public health that we have seen literally in anyone's lifetime. So as was mentioned earlier, there are millions and millions of dollars sloshing around in the system. And we have seen that a lot of it has been wasted. It has not been utilized for long-term solutions. It has not been utilized for actually fixing the system. It was just a whole bunch of money that people felt that they had to spend. So we have made some good investments. As I said, we put more money into mental health for kids in school. We put more money into making sure, as I said, Bob and I both fought for and worked with the county executive and the county board to get the new facility here in Racine County. It was a long time coming because of the services that we had to work on. Obviously, it took a long time to be able to get done. But I feel like we are doing good things. Now, I am going to, I'm sure there are people who are going to say, if we only raise taxes and spend another billion dollars, the world would be great. But we now see what it's like to borrow trillions from our grandchildren and give it to the government and see how they would spend it. Now, some has been spent well, but an awful lot of it hasn't. So I think that we should go back and look at where the money was invested, if it could have been done better, before we start to criticize the fact that we haven't been increasing funding when data factually shows it was the largest increase in our life. Where do you think it's been wasted? Um, I think if you look at, yeah, in Wisconsin specifically, I think if you look at the amount of money that we have been spending, as an example, um, just on all of the restrictions and the dollars that have been given out. Um, so we got $500 million. The governor is bragging about giving $500 million away for COVID relief grants. Okay. Most of those are in grants of $5,000. Now, if you were a business that was shut down by the governor's unconstitutional order, where you were forced to lose your business, your, your <coughs> restaurant closed or whatever, $5,000 check, kind of an embarrassment, right? It did nothing to really help you deal with the crisis that you had. So, I mean, there, there are a whole lot of things that we could have done better. Um, if you look at the way that schools have spent a lot of the dollars that we have, uh, it hasn't been invested in long-term solutions. Most of it has been invested in Band-Aids uh, because they can't make hard choices. Uh, so I feel like there, there's an awful lot that we could go into that I, I don't want to stop. 
Sure, I'll go ahead. Um, so I think one really great example of a place where resources have been spent by Governor Beavers and here in Racine County is on the federally qualified health clinics that we are hopefully going to have in this community in the coming years. Um, this is investment from the state that is coming to Racine that would not have happened if not for the American Rescue Plan and um, other legislation that's passed since that's, that's helping us cut costs on creating that federally qualified health clinic. And what this is going to do very concretely is provide care for people who are not getting it in Racine right now. And we know that there are a lot of people in Racine, particularly people of color and low income folks, who are not getting the care that they need in our community right now. Um, and that this is going to be an incredible access. So I'm very excited about that. I think it's critically important. Um, but to sort of circle back on the, on the local government question, um, if you talk to uh, members of um, local government, Democrats, Republicans, independents, you will hear from them about the fact that they are in a jam when it comes to allocating resources year after year. And the reason is because we have not been doing our part at the state to make sure that they are getting their fair share of our revenue. Tony talked about our significant surplus at the state level. What I think we should be doing with that money is making sure that it is going to the kinds of programs that we've been talking about here tonight that really need it. And um, the governor just this week, I believe, uh, proposed a shared revenue increase for the next budget. I really hope that we can consider that because we need to make sure that our local governments are able to provide these critical services that allow people in our community to do more than just survive, but really build lives for themselves, um, meeting where they're saving, <laughs> where they're raising their children, um, and wanting to stay in Wisconsin. I'm just going to quickly pause for, and I just want to make the statement that this is a $1.5 billion and $5 billion surplus. We're not raising taxes. We have the funds, we have the funds in place now to take on these choices. And telehealth medicine, we haven't even covered that tonight. It is crucial and a way to start giving to communities far and wide who don't have the transportation or who are too depressed to actually get up out of bed, get dressed and get to their providers. They can now access across the city, state, and even across our country. So, this is, I, I hear this all the time, as I'm sure the speaker will uh, agree with me. Um, well, there's a lot of talk about a $5.2 billion surplus. I think what people need to understand is that surplus was projected when we were in a period of some of the, uh, when, when uh, federal money was flush in most households, there was uh, record sales tax collections in the state. Well, based on the policies that have been put into place by the federal government going forward, we're moving into an area where that spending may not uh, go forward. Budget surplus was only a projection. Who knows where it'll be once we start to get further into the next biennium and so on. Uh, and so there will be less money. Uh, the, there's a lot of talk about the federal money that has come in, ARPA, a number of other programs. Uh, went to one of the uh, state uh, think tanks that we use um, and took a look at, they uh, set out some ARPA state allocations to mental health projects. Wisconsin is in here. Uh, we did uh, 4.5 million for the Milwaukee County Mental Emergency Health Center, which, which is, uh, everyone agreed, probably a good investment. But as I look at other states that are in here, Illinois allocated 50 million towards trauma, mental health, and behavioral health services. Um, Colorado has at least, uh, I would say if I, if I looked at this, seven, 33, over 60 million in various programs that they have. Um, Indiana devoted 50 million to a range of mental health grants. Another state close to us provided funding for summer academic and mental health programs for students, 35 billion, uh, $35 million. And so one of the things that um, I hope people will understand is that one of the things that the legislature did not have very much say in was um, where this federal money went. That was at the sole discretion um, of the executive branch, um, the governor uh, of the state. And with that, we've uh, 
a co-authored a, a resolution with uh, Senator Koyanga that would bring uh, back the legislature's voice. Those of us in the legislature are closer to our communities. Um, and so I have uh, been to both the Towns Association meeting, uh, village, uh, mid, uh, municipalities meetings as well, uh, with various uh, different uh, branches of government that, that uh, are in the district. Uh, most of the requests are all the same. And, and I, I know that we will be looking at um, short, long, or short, medium, and long-term ways to be able to uh, work through shared revenue and other per, uh, perspectives that we have so that we don't uh, burden our taxpayers with more property tax uh, and look at other solutions that may be in other states to be able to uh, fund critical services at those levels. And that will start um, as we begin the next session. Could you actually expound on that a little bit? You mentioned that all the, the requests are kind of the same from the municipalities mm -hmm. you're talking to. Is the request is please give us more? Or is it, or what is it? What is the so there, there, there are mainly, uh, there are probably about four to five different areas. Transportation is one, broadband is one, um, EMS, uh, and uh, other uh, professional safety services, fire and EMS. And so, um, so for example, if you go out here in the city, we're seeing you have a fire department that is um, fully funded by the city, by the taxpayers. Um, they have paid firefighters, et cetera. If I take you out to the village of Raymond, to the uh, uh, town of Norway, they have volunteer fire departments, volunteer EMS. Um, they are, uh, those programs are, are, are becoming very difficult to staff. And so we've got to find a way to, uh, whether it be through consolidation with other departments and centers for that, whether it be to take and find some way uh, so that smaller communities get the, the amount of shared revenue that they need uh, to be able to provide these services. We've got to do something because there are places in northern Wisconsin that for a, a, a brief period of time went without ambulance services where uh, times have uh, uh, response times have gone up uh, by minutes to uh, 30 minutes or so for an ambulance. Those things just can't happen in the state. And so we're well aware of that if you're active in the towns association and, and bigger municipalities, um, they are looking at uh, platforms that we can work with them on uh, to be able to find solutions that will fund these things in the future. Um, and this is a comment from someone on Facebook. Um, the, the comment says, is what we need is mental health care in jails and prisons. Um, that's obviously not a question, but it, again, this is one I really don't have an answer to. So what kind of programs are there in place now specifically for, for prisons and for jails in the state of Wisconsin for mental health care? Or, what, or do you think there would be more? What is kind of going on at the state level about providing care to people who might be incarcerated? I'm sure I can answer. An open question. <laughs> Um, so I recently had a couple of conversations with folks who work um, in correctional institutions in the Racine area um, and had a panel actually with folks um, who worked in all sorts of professions um, within DOC, um, including you know, teachers, folks who are working on um, uh, trades and getting folks ready for the workforce when they leave prison and also people who are providing mental health services. And um, they talked about how difficult it is um, to stay in that position and to recruit more people into those positions because they are just not being compensated appropriately for the work that they're doing. And if they were to leave and go into private practice, they would just be making uh, so much more. And those people are coming in with debt, right? They've been at school for many years, um, often struggling to get by, uh, taking out debt, and now um, are being asked to make a salary that's really not appropriate for the level of work that they're doing. So that's very concrete piece that I think we need to be working on. You know, I've met some of these folks, again, who do this work in, in our prisons in the Racine area, um, just incredible people, right, who are doing this work for all the right reasons and know how important their work is, that these relationships that they have with the people um, in prison in, in Racine and, and around the state, of course, um, could mean a huge difference <laughs> in their lives, right? Could mean whether or not they have the ability to really fully rehabilitate when they leave prison. Um, and what we want is people who, when they leave, uh, are ready to come back and, and be part of our community. And so critically important that we make sure that those positions are supported and, and compensated appropriately. 
don't have to be there, but I'm having a question. Grab us right out. So one of the things that we need to do, I know, right there. Uh, one of the things that we do need to do in the next budget, and it is, so um, one of the things as a state legislator, you get to talk to an awful lot of people. Um, and I spent some time with the family um, of a gentleman who's Trinidad, from Trinidad. Um, and they explained to me how, imagine taking a job where you are making a decent living, it's 19 to $21 an hour, but starting in that job, you knew that you were probably going to have mandatory overtime. So an entire second shift. So you work eight hours, then you have an entire second shift that you are required to stay. You go home for eight hours, and then you start the same thing again. Uh, they told me one week where he had literally six days in a row of forced overtime. Um, so I mean, just think of your body if that was the way that you were going every day. Not voluntary. Not where you say, you know what, I'd like to earn some extra money for Christmas. I'll do it extra. Um, I think we have relied an awful lot and probably pushed as hard as we can um, in, a, in a way that I don't think is fair on the employees that we have. So we need to do a better job. We need to increase pay. Uh, it is not right that somebody can walk into uh, anybody in Racine and earn just as much, if not more, um, working in a job that is less stressful than going to the service desk uh, or delivering their service to inside there. So I hope in the next budget um, that we'll be able to give an increase um, commensurate with the job make sure that when people are looking at all the careers, they do not say working for the state is low on the uh, uh, list of priorities as opposed to at least being in the middle. Um, one of the things we haven't talked about, yes, when you're in jail, hopefully you get some help. But the problem is even when they do get help in prison, the aftercare is not there. And we need to really emphasize that they get real aftercare once they are released from jail. And one of the things I'm hoping that with this new 988 number, if we have it more accessible and people are more aware of it, most people don't even know that's why you can't dial your area, you have to dial your area code now. They don't know what 988 is. Where it's a crisis line for people to come and have a mobile crisis team that includes mental health professionals and certified peer specialists that will come and help de-escalate a situation or send the proper response team that needs to go there if it's a more violent issue or if the patient, or excuse me, the, the patient needs to be separated from their family or whatever the needs may be. But it is a new avenue and we need to make sure that people are aware of this new avenue. People just don't know. Thank you. So I'll just add, I'll go back to, to like I said, as part of the work in the building commission, you get to, to see a, a variety of different investments we make in the capital budget that probably most people don't understand that we actually work on. <laughs> uh, there were significant investment made in this past year to enumerate dollars that would modernize um, health services um, facilities within our prison system. You modernize the facilities, um, you provide those people that are incarcerated to access to different types of care. Um, a lot of that modernization was to be able to, to provide telehealth services amongst other things so that they could get the right treatment in the right place. Um, I, I think there's one of the things we, we talk about like with the shortages of um, individuals that provide this care. I think we have to do a better job of opening up. Uh, we, we currently, uh, I believe we passed a bill in the last side that would allow um, based on uh, Interjurisdictional compact to allow uh, practice uh, people that practice this uh, craft in other states to provide care in our state. Uh, we're going to have to, um, with every industry that we talk to, sometimes the ability to take and say that all we have to do is forgive loans and, and get kids in school. Well, there are, there are, are shortages now. We have to make sure that uh, people coming out of uh, military service have expertise in some of these areas. We need to do, do a better job of making sure that they get uh, into practice um, based on their experience and not based on going back totally into school. And so um, I think that modernizing these facilities, finding ways to give them access to, to the care at the right time, uh, I think we're taking steps in the right direction. I mentioned earlier that I'll never cough and just saw my voice go. So I'm just like a puppet for this final question. <laughs> um, is it going to be discussion? Yeah, I think so. Just one up here? Yeah. Is there going to be more funding 
for more training for police officers, more assurance to people sentenced to prison will be guaranteed to get mental health treatment and drug treatment. So we kind of covered that, but if you can elaborate on it, I guess that would be very helpful. I've been referring to specific more to more. Of course, we can do the last question. So, so I had mentioned that we did put money in the last um, in the last legislature to be able to increase training uh, for law enforcement to be able to understand um, the mental health challenges that many of the people that they interact with face. So I think, um, first of all, I want to see how the money that we allocated goes first before I say we're going to double, triple, whatever it's going to be. I want to make sure that that money is being spent wisely. We don't, please don't know the answer to it or just help. Um, I would also <laughs> say that, as Bob mentioned, since we did put a significant amount of bonding, um, which is borrowed money in to be able to renovate some of these facilities. Um, the hope is that as we see the people who are already working inside the prison system, giving them a better opportunity to utilize tools that the, the private sector does, hopefully that will have an impact. Um, that won't just automatically mean we have to put a bunch more money in there until we see exactly again what's necessary. So I think we've made good first steps. Um, I don't want to say here's a new concrete thing that we're going to do until we see how some of the investments that we began to make really will make a difference. I will say one of the things I'd like to push for in the next budget is that, um, as we talked about, Racine County is going to have a new juvenile detention facility, supposed to break ground in the spring with hopefully occupation sometime in the next 18 months after that. Um, so I want to make sure that we continue to utilize that facility, not just for kids from Racine County, which will be the primary focus, but they will probably contract with the state and other counties to be able to provide those services. I want to make sure that whatever state contracts that we use for Racine County, we have adequate resources following that style. So the taxpayers of Racine County don't end up subsidizing it, but also we have what I think is going to be a state-of-the-art facility being received, shared, if we have the ability uh, with other people using across the state. Sure. Yeah, I think I think in some ways, you know, I've, I've talked about this question. Um, I do think, of course, it is essential that law enforcement um, in every part of the state receives these services to make sure, or these trainings to make sure that they're able to better provide services um, to people in our state who are experiencing crisis. And, you know, at, at the risk of uh, being called obsessed with local government funding, what I will say is that that's really the, where this, where the rubber hits the road on this question. And it's making sure that our local governments have the money that they need to fund essential services. And law enforcement being trained to uh, appropriately respond to a mental health crisis is an essential service. And so uh, again, I really hope that in the next budget, we are able to um, address shared revenue. Um, there are so many places, uh, you know, I represent primarily Racine, city of Racine, and we have seen cuts in so many places. Um, in health services at the library, right? Um, and we are feeling that really, really everywhere in this community. And so I hope that there's an ability for us to address uh, all of those needs in the next cycle. I have more of a statement. Um, a lot of people don't know what the crisis intervention team is for officers. They get CIT trained to work with mental illness patients. They've seen them, they hear the stories, they sit down and they learn how to de-escalate a situation. And we really need to focus on that and let people know most people are not aware. If you call 911 and it's a mental health emergency, ask for a CIT trained officer to go. They have the experience and the ability to de-escalate a situation. So we just need to make sure people are aware of that. Thank you. Um. Assuming, again, not all of you can be elected to a few of you can be dozens, but again, assuming you would be in the legislature in the next uh, in the next session, um, would you wrap a question whether it's related to mental health, whether it's completely unrelated? What would, what's your priority? What's the first thing to follow up on your mind? So um, right now there are three priorities. Um, that is uh, looking at uh, the economy and where it's headed. Um, we have inflationary pressures that we've talked about now, whether they be local government, whether they be individuals. Uh, we have a school system in the state, um, K through 12, especially, that is in need of reform, uh, especially uh, we've got 600,000 students that can't read or do math to grade level. If you don't think that uh, uh, trickles over into mental health problems and everything else, you should uh, tour some of the schools and so on and see um, uh, the way that uh, th those students are affected. Uh, we also need to build a workforce. 
The other thing is, is to, to ensure that uh, uh, our communities are safe. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, uh, our citizens feel safe. I've, I've gotten a call from a, a resident that lives in uh, um, Racine here uh, that said that uh, they would really wish that they could sit out in the morning and have a cup of coffee on their own patio, but can't because of the gunfire that they hear. So we need to ensure that uh, our communities are safe for our citizens, whether that means investing in law enforcement or, or other services. Um, but I think those are, are, are three of the top things that, that we will look at. We will have to spend the state resources prudently. Um, people want to talk about $5 billion surpluses, et cetera. Um, I'll wait to see where that comes in. If we, if we budget and invest our dollars wisely, uh, with results, we should be able to to, to uh, make uh, things better for people in this state uh, and including our own community. Um, well, there, there are a lot of issues that we have to figure out. Um, if I think about the ones that are the most important, I, I just think back, I, I spent most of the summer um, just walking door to door. And one of the questions that I would ask people is, after the election, what do you think is the most important issue that we should focus on? Um, and I would say overwhelmingly people worry about the cost of living in all aspects, from the property taxes that they pay, to the groceries that they buy at the store, to what's gonna happen with the price of gas. So some of those we can have an impact on, an awful lot we can't. But one of the things that I worry about that's, that's really tied to that is the ability for us to make sure people keep more of their own money so they can help deal with the rising costs. Um, there are a lot of people who want to spend whatever surplus we have. We don't know what the number really is. Um, I think that a lot of that money should go back to the people who actually put it into the system. Um, I know that right now we have a big problem demographically in the fact that we are not keeping enough young people in Wisconsin, and we are also not keeping enough successful seniors here either. Uh, one of the things that breaks my heart is seeing people who make the decision to live in another state that is warmer, can't fix the weather, but they make a decision to live in another state for seven months because of the extreme savings they have on their taxes. So we need to reduce the tax burden in Wisconsin to keep people living here for their hopefully retirement years, but also to make sure that we do a better job attracting young people. Um, and we do that by having an affordable place to live and a great place to enjoy all the amenities that we have. I was right about crime. Um, crime is a major problem. And that's the number two thing that I hear as I talk to people going door to door. They worry about the ability to be safe. Um, people who used to visit Racine or Milwaukee that live west of the eye rarely do so anymore because they don't feel safe uh, being in the community. That's gotta be changed. That's how we have a resilient place to not only live, work, but also thrive. So I think making sure that if you commit a crime, you're locked up and that you don't get let out of jail earlier than you should, I think that's the thing that we need to focus on. And that's gonna take some money. Um, and the last thing that I would say is fixing some of the problems that we have seen over the course of the past two years. Um, we saw mistakes made in school. We saw mistakes made in state government. We saw that basically people were allowed to work from home, which didn't mean they worked a lot of the time. Um, one of the biggest issues that my office has worked on is just getting people a license because a bureaucrat at the state isn't working and won't get back to them for months at a time. Um, that is something I know you've written on it. I know people have written our office time and time again because the flaws in the way that state government is not working for them. So my hope is we get an opportunity for a little bit of things to change uh, and we get to um, January with some different attitudes and hopefully the priorities that everybody can focus on. So if I am reelected in November, I will continue the work that I've been doing for the last couple of years, which really starts with listening to people in the community and then doing everything we can to meet people where they are at. And so if we have kids in school who are not getting care, and they're going there every day, I think that's where we should be providing care for those kids. Um, teachers have that experience with them, they see them in the schools, they know if something is going on with a kid and we need to make sure that they have access there. Um, I've talked about a lot of specific bills already um, and co-authored more that I think need to move forward <coughs> because I do think that if we can address mental health in this state and in this community, it is going to mean that so many other things are possible. And uh, we all know on this panel, in this room, listening, people who are having a very hard time getting through each day because of the mental health challenges that they're experiencing that are untreated or not adequately treated. 
And so I think there are a number of specific proposals that we've talked about here um, that I know NAMI has advocated for and heard about and helped craft um, that we, I think, can and should move forward. Next session. Yeah, one of the things we haven't touched on tonight, and I think it's one of the biggest issues we have in Racine County, is we keep talking about incarceration and when someone's in crisis, but we're not talking about what happens after the crisis. Again, many people from Racine County who are getting inpatient are sent to Winnebago on the safe side instead of our local hospitals here, who have gone from 58 beds to 16, and that keeps declining. So we need to push at Racine County and all of you in the audience to call your local administrators at your hospitals and ask them why they're closing their beds. Because that is insurance payers. If they get chaptered, they can stay there. And they can be, well, chaptered, you get paid by the state. But they should be at the hospitals in their local communities where their friends and family can visit them while they're going through a crisis. You shouldn't be put in the back of a, a police car, handcuffed, escorted up to Winnebago or Mendota, and then treated like a prisoner. I've seen this time and time again. Instead, we could be treated decently and in our in our county. All right, well, um, police officers, thank you all. Thanks so much, all four of you, for taking time to answer these questions. Oh, I'm Andrew Jack. One, one more. Um, we we like to have one final question, if that works for all the panelists. So, um, and uh, then we'll kind of get to the wrong that one. Yep, I, I'll <laughs> save you because I don't mind. I'll read this one. So, okay. Um, so, in all of your view, what is the role for state legislators in ending stigma and discrimination unfairly associated with mental health conditions? Mm -hmm. Let me conclude with that. And I'm, I'm not sure the order when you're starting from the left to go to the right. Go for it. I am up on the left. I am from the right. <laughs> <laughs> um, Educating the public with healthcare workers needs to be continued and expanded. Legislators can do this by supporting programs like NAMI, and we need to prioritize mental health awareness programs, and we need to work to remove the stigma that goes with suffering from a mental illness. We need to change the language we use, even among members in the healthcare field. We must stop defining people by their disease and start using people first language, such as a person living with mental illness instead of a schizophrenic person. Legislators can help by showing that mental health care is a priority. Legislators can also write bills which protect people living with mental illness. And legislators need to listen to the stories individuals living with mental illness have to share and hear from their families before bills are written. Thank you. Yeah, I think we can really take our lead from organizations like NAMI, right? And what NAMI does is goes out in public and talks about mental health and then also provide safe spaces for people to um, share their experience and get support and talk to other people who are experiencing similar things, among other really good work. So um, I think there's a lot that we do up in Madison, <laughs> writing bills, trying to get policies passed, but I think there are also really important roles for all of us to have here in our communities, um, partnering with the kind of organizations uh, that do this work and reach different parts of the community. Um, and make sure that we are continuing the really important shift that is happening, which is people talking more about mental health. I do think that we've made really significant progress. Um, you know, I think about how my parents or my grandparents thought about mental health versus how my generation or the people who come uh, after me are talking about it, and that has been really incredible. And that is largely thanks to people um, being willing to share their own stories and their experiences and be brave in that way. Um, and provide that space for other people to do, to do so as well. So really, I think it is uh, being present uh, and making sure that we are uh, providing further spaces for dialogue and talking about the ways that mental health um, impacts us and our families and our communities. Well, thank you for having us here tonight. Uh, thank you very much for the forum. And you know, it's interesting, um, one of my favorite phrases is, was coined by our former county executive, Jean Jacobson, and she says, the world is run by those who show up. Um, and it doesn't matter if it's state government or federal government or local government. Um, the fact that there is literally one forum during this entire election cycle, and it's being sponsored by you. So thank you for that. Um, I think that's part of the advocacy that really needs to happen. Um, I think there is not a person that I know who does not have somebody that they love who's dealing with mental illness. And I think we need to make sure that people appreciate the fact that there is nothing to be embarrassed by. 
there was nothing to be stigmatized by, and that's all of us just taking the time to listen to him and write about that too. But I also think more important than anything is people taking the time to tell their story to legislators, and our job is to listen. So what can legislators do? We can be good listeners, which I think most people usually are, regardless of party or where they're from. That's why people get into this business. Uh, but I think it's also making sure that the organizations who care or who have a role to play realize how important they are, that they are the ones that have to educate us because legislators' time is finite. You can't talk to everybody about every topic. But having that personal connection, finding people to tell their story, I think that makes all the difference. So thank you for being here. Thank you to those who are watching, and we really appreciate your time. Yeah, I, I also will thank uh, thank you for having this uh, venue, and uh, thanks to all that came here, asked questions, and so on. Um, I guess I differ a little bit uh, because I believe that uh, the only thing a legislator legislator actually can do um, to do these things is based on their actions. Um, do you actually live by by uh, the things that you believe, and how do you carry yourself when you're in your district? And um, you know, we talk a lot about listening to people. Um, my office door has been opened, everyone. Um, I will listen to any group that uh, has to be here. But I believe it's the, the actions that you do and how you carry yourself in the community. I also believe you have to be invested in the community. And that means that, um, as Rob said, uh, you have to show up and you have to be there um, across all se segments of the community. And uh, that's how you understand the issues that are here. You also have to um, understand, I think the one, the, the biggest thing that I've learned um, so far is that um, it's kind of easy to, to think that you can solve a problem all at once. Um, it takes um, a lot of hard work and focus um, to keep going and, and possibly do um, smaller steps at a time to reach a, a larger goal. And I think that's something that people in the community have to, to understand as well. What are the things we can legislate for? What kind of policy can we put out there? But then are we taking incremental steps to get there and try to understand the decisions we make and why we make them? But that comes, again, like I said, it's how you carry yourself. It's the examples you have. I, I'm a father of four kids. Um, I can tell you the way that I was raised um, is not the way that I raise my kids now because the examples are different. The times are different. Kid, kids are exposed to too many things too fast. Um, and I guess one of the things that I've always told people is that um, I've, I've found out that um, example and consistency um, works best with, with the kids that I've brought up. They, uh, and, and you don't know that until they get possibly in their 30s or 40s, or you may never know that. Um, but it's, it's, it's kind of the way that, 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 I've, that I've guided as I, as I work through these things because um, I've been told that, well, the example that you set that helped me get through this time or that you were consistently there. So I felt that when I was ready to talk to you, you would be there for me. And so if you carry yourself the same way with your constituents and treat them the same way that you treat family, um, I think that's, that's how we really make progress. So that's kind of where my thoughts are. Okay. Uh, first of all, let's give Adam a round of applause. Thank you so much. For being here. Let me have a round of applause for our candidates. This concludes our candidates forum. Thank you all for participating, for your questions, and remember to vote in November. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. No, I said, 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 I said